still raining a little bit outside. A little bit. But we are going to make rain in here. I have a couple of helpers that are going to help me lead this. Come on, please. So there are, uh, there are two things you need to know about making rain. One, just follow in. And so after we uh, kind of come by you, make a uh, movement, mimic exactly what we do. Come to one section and change it. You guys change and then wait. Keep doing what you're doing until it comes to you. Does that make sense? No. Great. <laughs> There's a steep warning here, Nancy. <laughs> and the second thing, and this is the most important part, we're going to practice this, is when I say the word peace, we need to stop as close to immediately as we can. Okay? So let's just practice this. Peace! Alright, that's pretty good. That's good. Get it, Nancy? Okay, so let's make some rain. picking the other survivors 
out of the water. Last week we talked about the church being a place of shelter, of shade, a sanctuary, a place of safety and peace. Saw a little bit of that yesterday, our gardening group outside, welcoming people into the memorial garden, our neighbors who were invited, people who walked across the street to see this place, to know it as their own sanctuary and place of safety too. Here we are in the boat. Jesus. Somebody came in this week and said, Pastor, here's an idea. What if we turn uh, this space out here, our kind of gathering area, as a nice cool spot when it gets really hot out in the summer? We've got air conditioning, we can provide cold water, we can maybe have some people and uh, welcome people into it. There you go. Shade. Shelter. Safety. Sanctuary with Jesus in the boat. I have a friend of mine, a colleague in Boston. She's the uh, executive director of the Council of Churches. She rides her bike all around Boston. She's got a little sign on the back of her bike that says clergy. And she likes to take pictures of it wherever she goes. She posts them on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and it's always kind of a really cool thing. And as a person that's been riding his bike around town, I've been trying to learn from her. This is a cool thing. She had this idea this week. She said, what if churches could provide an air pump and a repair kit in case I get a flat while I'm biking around Boston? And I said, no, oh, that's not a bad idea either. Come with your bike here. Safety, sanctuary, shelter with Jesus in the boat where there's peace, where there's calm. As this storm has erupted around us, and we've seen the storm erupting down in the Gulf Coast and all the flooding there, I was reminded of something some of our young people said in Lent when we were in the back room. What if we welcomed people to come here when there's a storm or a hurricane and we're out of power and people could come here and they could, they could stay here and they could, they could eat here and if we still have power, maybe they could charge up their stuff. Great idea. Shelter, <laughs> safety, sanctuary, peace, be still. Your mind starts cranking as you start to think of other ways we could develop our spot here as a nice place of sanctuary and safety and shade for those who are around us. And we'll continue to think about that. But what happens when that place of sanctuary that place of safety, that place of shade, becomes the place of violence and death. Where do the words, peace, be still, go then? Can we still hold on to that? Can we still make sense? Can we still be in the boat with Jesus if it's not even safe there. I like these uh, two letters that our bishops wrote. Help us think a little bit through this. Uh, I did not know until I read her letter uh, that two of the people that died were graduates from one of our Lutheran seminaries. And I didn't know that the gunman is also a member of another church called St. Paul Lutheran Church. Oh. Somehow when these tragedies strike, we tend to keep them at arm's length. I mean, they're tragic, they're horrible, we want to do something about it, but they're far away. Ferguson's far away, Baltimore's far away, even Charleston seems far away. And of course, we're linked to everyone. We are all made in the image and likeness of God, and we're, of course, connected to the whole body of Christ everywhere and every time. But somehow it seems a little deeper this time. People that our people know. Peace. Be still. I think the call to acknowledge where we are. What it means. How it impacts all of us. Is a good call. To pause and reflect. And maybe even repent. 
speak for myself, but I think for you too, I think a lot of us are more guilty of sins of ignorance than of intentionality against other people. But we are, after all, part of systems that are much bigger than ourselves, and most of us share a certain place of privilege in that, that we are mostly blind to. A moment to acknowledge that as the storms rage. It's a good call, I think. I think also, uh, you know, we are the people in the boat. If you want to keep with that image, we see ourselves rescuing others, handing out that life preserver, sharing a word of peace to others in the midst of the storm. We need to acknowledge that our church, not just our congregation, but the ELCA as a whole, is 98% white, despite our best efforts. For a lot of us, of course not all, but for a lot of us, we have some link anyway to kind of Northern Europe before our ancestors came here, and somehow we can't seem to break out of it. We need to acknowledge that, too. Somehow the life preservers we hand out and that word of peace tends to be the people that are just like us. I also think of uh, our Bishop Jim Hazelwood's call and thinking about uh, myself, I don't feel like I've ever really been in danger either leading worship or gathering for prayer. Bible study, even in the distressed people's lives, I've entered, and you have too. Think about the ministry that we do. We do a lot of good stuff. We try to reach out to others. And we've walked with each other in some pretty dark times. Those stormy gales of loss, of heartache, of diagnoses, of feeling lost and adrift in the midst of the sea, and yet we continue to remind Peace, be still. Somehow it's hard at this time to hold on to that promise. I saw a picture this week. It was drawn by a little girl. She's a member of that AMU church, Emmanuel, Mother Emmanuel, in Charleston. She drew a nice big picture of the church with its big white steeple and big white entranceway, nice grand building, a historic church in a historic neighborhood, which it is, that has withstood so many different storms throughout its life. But what's striking about this picture is she drew the people, the congregation, all outside the building, standing, it looks like, hand in hand. The faces look like they're smiling. In the midst of such heartache and tragedy, still being the church together. And the top part of the picture is filled with nine angels, one for each who was slain. There's that great line in Isaiah that even a child shall leave them. And I think she has. That when the storm hits, Wherever the storm hits, Jesus gives to us a word of peace. Thinking about what this might mean for us, I think the disciples in this story are instructive. Now, usually the disciples are the people that don't get it. And I think that is incredibly helpful, especially for me. They do three things in this little passage that I think are instructive for us. The first thing that they do is they actually get into the boat. So a lot of the disciples, not all, but a lot of them were fishermen. They knew their way around the boat. They knew where they were. They knew this piece of water. I read a little bit about this this week. It was a place that, because of the way the basin of the lake was and the way the, the fronts would come over, often there were storms at night. They would have known this. They should have said to Jesus, what if we left in the morning? It'll be safer. It'll be a better trip. But instead, Jesus says, let's go to the other side, and they get in the boat. Can we take that kind of risk? Even when it doesn't seem safe. Even when we're not sure what is even on the other side. When Jesus says, get in the boat, will 
you join him, even though the storms are rough and rocky, because he has there a word. Peace. The second thing they do is they turn. They turn to Jesus. I don't think in a real metaphoric way, but usually the word for, for repent is, is to turn, go a new direction. They certainly do. Uh, again, I'm not much of a seafarer. I've only been in a sailboat a couple of times. But I've been in a canoe a lot. Uh, one summer I was the waterfront director at our camp and uh, tried my best to teach kids how to canoe. So uh, this particular lake where I was the waterfront director had a lot of speedboats on it, water skiers. Now a speedboat with a water skier versus a canoe usually doesn't end up very well. Because usually what happens is the canoeer has one of two choices. They can do as they've been trained to do, which is to turn into the wave and ride it out. Or you can panic and let the wave hit you and end up in the water. I spent a lot of time that summer picking kids out of the drink. The disciples turn. It's counterintuitive to head right into the storm or right into the big wave. We want to run away. We want to stay safe. We want to protect ourselves. But they reveal to us, I think, that bit of truth. We can turn into that gale, that stormy tempest raging at us. Because who's in the boat with us, after all? The only one that can save us. And the third thing they do, which I think is probably the most important of them all, is they ask a question they don't have an answer to. I mean, we know the answer to the question, who are they with? We know it's Jesus. We know who Jesus is, Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who died for us, the one who rose from the dead. They don't know this yet. Who is this? And yet they get in the boat anyway, and they keep following as we think of the challenges in our lives, the divisions of our country and nation, our own state in that, between people we know and people we don't know, about the systems we're part of, perhaps even blindly, how will we address this? How will we solve it? I don't have an answer, do you? But it's asking the question. I think that's the faith that Jesus is fishing for here with them. Will you follow me anyway? Will you turn into the way? Will you get into the boat in the midst of the tempest, the raging sea, the blowing wind, with your fear 